but as far as what that decision is, you know, I'm as lost as you guys. Yes, I- sir, there she goes. Hello and welcome to episode 142 of Section 138. I'm your host, Mark Cauley, as always, joined by my co-host, Bryson and Jacob. How are you guys? I'm doing good, Mark. Another series at home where the Jays take it. They win the series. Now, the only thing... I'm going to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer here, but I think everyone can agree with me is it could have, it should have been a sweep, but we'll take three out of four getting closer to that second wild card spot. Things are looking up for the blue Jays right now. Yeah. They lose the first game in kind of catastrophic, catastrophic fashion. They were winning or they tied it two two. they go into extra innings. Brad hand comes out of the bullpen and things go downhill from there. He gives up a home run, another run. It ends up being a 5-2 loss, but they come back, they bounce back, they win the next three games of the series. And I think, you know, even if the win streak is gone, even if that perfect record at home is gone, I still think you got to be happy with taking three of four. Even if it's a team like Cleveland, you got to be happy with that. You can't ask for the Blue Jays to win every single game. They still, take, you know, have won seven of the last eight. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty happy even if they lose that game of how things have gone this week. But how are you, Jacob? You know what, Uh, even though they did lose one game, it's still been a fantastic homestand. And I'm just, every day seems like just a new day and a a new adventure really to see this team. And it's been fun watching them on the field, off the field via social media. But honestly, as a Blue Jay fan, I don't think anything, I don't think that, uh, I think this is honestly the best we've ever uh, felt this season. Yeah, seven games over 500 yesterday. Um, or two days ago on Wednesday when they won that game. And that was the first time since April 20th, 2018, they had accomplished that feat. And then eight games over 500 for the first time since the end of the 2016 season. So this is really some of the best baseball we're seeing in a while from the Blue Jays. And frankly, some of the best starts out of the rotation from the Blue Jays. And that's pretty much the highlight from this week. And I think the entirety of the second half, you know, the offense, especially in this series, wasn't totally clicking. Yes, you have that eight run game, but you also have, you know, three zero game. You have that five two game. The offense wasn't totally kick- clicking, but you can, of course, be always happy with what the starting rotation was doing. Um, since the All Star break, the Blue Jays lead the American League in ERA out of the rotation. We've seen guys like Steven Matz really step up in his last start against Cleveland. We've seen guys like Ross Stripling. He really stepped up when six scoreless innings at one point retired 12 in a row against Cleveland. Of course, you have the old reliables in Ryu, Ray, Manoa, Barrios coming into the rotation and having that phenomenal start in his first outing. Um, With the rotation being what it is, Right now it's six guys. The Blue Jays have the, all the doubleheaders coming up. They have a long stretch of games. They have an off day Monday, I believe, and then they're right back into it. Um, I think they go to Anaheim for a series, and they have a doubleheader then because of a rain out earlier this year. So they got a big stretch of games. Um, eventually, they're going to settle into a pattern of a five-man rotation. At that point, who do you take out? Is it Steven Matz? Is it Ross Stripling? Who's the odd man out in this situation? Because both have been pretty good. You know, both of them came out in this series and were fighting for their job and did the absolute best and all you could ask of them. But one of them has got to go. Who are you taking out? Good luck with this one, Jacob. <laughs> I Here's the thing. I'm going to say it's Steven Matz that is taken out of the rotation because here's the thing. Ross Stripling is here next season. Blue Jays probably want to keep him in the rotation. Maybe Nate Pearson comes up, takes his spot, or makes it a little bit more competitive. But I still think that the the long-term goals, or at least immediate future plus next season goals, is to have Ross Stripling in your starting rotation. And I think, honestly, like his his numbers are not the greatest this season. A 430, or Stephen Matz is a 430 ERA. Ross Stripling, a little bit worse actually at a 443 ERA but I feel like it's a combination of some really bad stretches and some really good stretches for Stripling and you saw in his first seven starts his ERA was up at 720 and then his next seven uh, it was like at under one or under two or something like that and it got to the point where his ERA was actually under four for the season and then he just had a couple of bad outings and then a couple of good outings but uh, post the trade deadline and the all-star break and so with with Ross Stripling, I do think that his numbers aren't necessarily a reflection of 
not being very good every start. It's just been, he's good. Sometimes he does struggle sometimes. I mean, he, he obviously had those mechanical changes early on in the season, but he almost has been a completely different pitcher. Whereas with Steven Matz, it's other than his first couple starts where his ERA was in the ones, it was fantastic. He just has been mediocre at best. And I mean, he's not a bad fifth option, but when you have six options, he's probably the odd man out. And it's a lefty option in the bullpen. I mean, there's Ryan Barucki and there's Tim Meza. That's not a bad option, especially considering that Steven Matz could be stretched out. Could give him three, two or three, maybe four innings if you absolutely need it. If you, I mean, we haven't seen an opener in a couple months, but if you wanted to do that, then there's a guy that can come out. Although, yeah, yeah as, as Bryson is detesting that, I don't think that's it's a good idea. I, I do like the traditional rotation, whether it's five or six men. However, when you have six men, I think that it is going to be Steven Matz that is the odd man out. Just considering Stripling's here next season, and he's shown flashes of being extremely good. I, I don't think that you take that guy out of your rotation. Yes, it's definitely a bit of a gamble. What Do you get the early season Ross Stripling? Do you get the post, uh, post-mechanical post change Ross Stripling? But I do think that that's probably the better option for the Blue Jays rather than Steven Matz, where you do realize that you probably every start are going to get mediocrity at best. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a tough one. I'm not going to lie. Um, I think I've bounced back. You guys know I've kind of gone back and forth this year. I said at first, Ross Stripling would be the guy to eventually go to the bullpen, maybe post-trade deadline, when the Jays get an arm or if the Jays got an arm. And over the past month, I think it's flipped. It's kind of shifted towards Steven Matz. And I have to agree with Jacob. I got to keep it on Steven Matz is the guy who is the odd man out of this rotation. The good news is because of the doubleheaders, uh, Mark, you were mentioning it. The Jays have one, of course, this weekend against the Red Sox. They have one next week uh, at some point against the Angels. And it's going to be one of those weird doubleheaders because one of those games, they're going to be the home team in Anaheim. So, I mean, we saw it a lot last year. But anyways, it's just going to be, I guess, it's in their favor to do that or for to have a six-man rotation for these doubleheaders. But yes, eventually something is going to have to, I guess, go or eventually they're going to have to go back to a five-man rotation because, quite frankly, they won't need it. And then, of course, you're going to want to have your best guys going out every five days. For me, Steven Matz is the odd man out unless something miraculously changes. Um, I just think Ross Stripling, ever since his bad April, because we know he had a really bad April, he's put things together. Um, he has really turned his season around more than Steven Matz. For Steven Matz, he got off to a really good start and he kind of faded back towards mediocrity. But for Ross Stripling, I think in my opinion, I think you guys can agree. And Mark, he was your most improved player, I believe, at the um, at the midseason awards. Is the turnaround that Ross Stripling had, the uprise that he had, is pretty significant compared to what I saw or what I've seen from Steven Matz. And that's why tonight, or even with this five man rotation, I just feel like I'm more comfortable with it. But then, if you want to look on the other side, with Ross Stripling having a lot of experience as a reliever, could he be a good, a, a, you know, addition to the bullpen? See, that's why you look at it from both sides, but I feel like for that reason, you got to stay or that the philosophy that I have is you got to stay with your best guys. You got to stay with the guys who are pitching better to stay in the rotation. And right now that's Ross Stripling and Ross Stripling is still actually making adjustments on the fly. He came out last night and said he made another recent adjustment to help him finish his leg lift instead of rushing it down on the mound. And it pretty much drives the plate with force. So something with his wind up and lifting his leg and everything. And he, after that, he called it a Pete Walker special. So, you know, clearly Pete Walker's working with everybody here. He's turning, he's trying to turn everyone's season around or put everyone on a, you know, a good season. And he's really been one of the main pieces or main reasons to why Ross Stripling's had to turn around the way that he has. Because I remember too, going back into May after his ERA of seven to start the year, like you guys mentioned, he completely changed his windup or he went to a windup. And then of course, we've seen this with other pitchers on the team, and I think another big or the other biggest example that we have is Robbie Ray, the turnaround that he had with Robbie Ray. But for Ross Stripling, going back to him, you you are you guys are right. So neither Stripling or Matts um, get a start this weekend against um, the Red Sox. So or no, actually, yeah, no, none of them do, which is good. So you're sending out your best guys this weekend in a crucial four game series. And then I guess in uh, Anaheim next week, one of them is, is going to go out again. There's going to be a double header. You're going to see everybody on a road trip next week. And I feel like after next weekend, they're going to have to make a decision on this because I think it's going to have to come sooner rather than later about going back to a five-man rotation. But yeah, 
you wonder this and then you say as well is if somebody of these if one of these guys go to the bullpen then who goes down to triple a because obviously T taylor saucedo is only here right now because walking soria who i guess you can't go on an, an, the injury list without being a true blue jay is already on the injury list so taylor saucedo is currently in the bullpen for that reason if um if soria comes back and then if you move somebody to the bullpen who do you send down to AAA? It's going to be a tough one. There's a couple names here that you may be able to, I guess, decide on, but it's it's a tough situation that the Jays are in, but it's a good one to have. But for Ross Stripling, I think from what I've seen, especially seeing him last Friday at the uh, the Jays home opener at Rogers Center, I think he deserves to stay in the rotation for the time being. I don't, maybe it's something that the Jays kind of monitor. They can go back and forth. It's not like they have to make a set in stone decision between Ross Stripling or Steven Matz, but right now, I agree with Jacob. I think Ross Stripling's the guy that stays in the rotation. I'll disagree with you. I think they do have to make a set in stone decision. I, I think once they commit to one of these guys moving to the bullpen, they have to stick with it. They can't be moving back and forth with, you know, Ross Stripling being a, a bulk guy one day and then making a start the next time through the rotation. They got to stick with whatever decision they make. Um, but as far as what that decision is, you know, I'm as lost as you guys. I like instinctually, I want to lean Ross Stripling. Uh, I think I got a soft spot for Ross Stripling, but you look at the numbers, he has been very good. And I think he's earned it more than Steven Matz. Um, you know, maybe this is a little bit of partial splits, but you go back to when Ross Stripling really turned things around on May 24th. Um, he has a 3.39 ERA in. 12 starts, 13 games since that point. You look at Steven Matz, numbers are pretty good still over that split, but a 3.91 ERA in 10 starts. Of course, we saw him hit the uh, COVID IL uh, at some point during that stretch. But you look at the numbers, um, Ross Dribbling has been better. And of course, that's including his one horrible start when we saw him only get one out and uh, give up six runs to the Red Sox. So, um, you know, just based on those numbers and based on um, what we've seen out of both of them this season and kind of the trends we've seen with, you know, Matt's being so good in his first three or four starts of the year and then kind of falling apart and Stripling being the opposite, being able to make adjustments, being able to stay in the rotation and keep making improvements. I lean Ross Stripling, but at the same time, then you have to consider the alternative. Like what happens when Steven Matt's go to the bullpen? And in his career, Steven Matt's only had six innings in relief. In his entire career, he's only pitched five games, six innings as a reliever. Um, over that span, uh, he has a 6.0 ERA in his six innings as a reliever compared to a 4.33 ERA as a starter. You look at the splits for Ross Stripling as a reliever, which we know he has done throughout his career, a lot throughout his career. He has 145 innings as a reliever, 382 innings as a starter, 4.19 ERA as a starter. 3.1 ERA in his career as a reliever. So Stripling has historically been better as a reliever than he has been as a starter. Now that doesn't include the improvements he's made this season out of the rotation. And like we've mentioned, the Pete Walker special, all that Pete Walker has done working with him to get him where he is this year. Um, but that being said, like, I think, you know, Stripling, if you are just choosing who's better in the rotation, it's Ross Stripling, but that's not all the equation is. You got to include Steven Matz when you look at what's going to happen when you move him to the bullpen. So, I mean, all that being said, I'm still leaning stripling, but it is such a hard decision to make. And I really don't envy Ross Atkins or um, Mark Spiro or Charlie Montoyo in making this decision because it seems like as impossible as they come. And, um, you know, the easy cop out is to just roll with a six man rotation, even after this stretch of double headers and, you know, to some extent, I think the Blue Jays could. I think, you know, you look at guys like Hinjin Ryu, we know he enjoys having that extra day of rest. Um, Alec Manoa is a guy that the Blue Jays might be looking to limit his innings down the stretch. Maybe that's another advantage of the six-man rotation, having him start, you know, one less day um, every couple of weeks. Maybe that helps in terms of limiting, limiting his workload, limiting his innings. Maybe that's something you look at for the Blue Jays, but then again, Long term, we know that Robbie Ray isn't a fan of that extra day of rest. Jose Barrios isn't a fan of that extra day of rest. And those are your two best starters in the rotation. So that's something that you can't really mess with. So all that being said, there's a lot of different factors at play here. And you can't really there, – there's no decisive way, um, you know, whether it's Ross Stripling or Steven Matz. There's no right or wrong answer in here. And 
like I said, I'm leaving, I'm leaning towards Ross Stripling, but it is such a hard decision to make. And I don't envy Ross Atkins or Charlie Montoyo in making this decision. One thing you just mentioned that I want to touch on real quick is you mentioned how Robbie Ray, Jose Barrios, some of your best starters, same with Alec Manoa. And I mean, Hyunjin Ryu is had a bit of or not as good a season as he did last year but he's still one of the better pitchers in the league i though that's four guys say you have ross stripling as your fifth guy i'd still think that's a pretty good rotation however if you keep steven Matz in the rotation you have two guys who are mediocre to good you know they're not uh, at the same level as the other two guys or the other four guys but they're not terrible pitchers and i would rather have a couple more starts out of those four guys than give those to a combined Steven Matz and Ross Stripling, I guess is how uh, the best way to put it. It doesn't mean that they're bad. doesn't mean that they couldn't be good out of the bullpen, but I feel like if down the stretch, you say the Blue Jays need to win a series, they needed to win this series. They got fantastic starting pitching. Say the situation presents itself in the final couple series of the year and you need to win the series to make the playoffs. I would prefer to have it set in stone some of your best guys, the the top four guys in your rotation, maybe Stripling as your your fifth guy pitch instead of Steven Matz and Ross Stripling kind of in the rotation at the same time. Because I do think that, yes, that does help Ryu perhaps, but I, I wouldn't say that the extra quantity of starters would necessarily improve the quality of it. Because now that you have Jose Barrios, you have a, a fantastic top four. And, and I even top five with Stripling, the way he does present himself at times. He, he is very good when he is on his game. So I think that when you have the, the top of the rotation that you do, it makes sense to stick with them and give them the innings because I think that that would be the better option going down the stretch into the playoffs or anything. Like it just, it makes more sense to have your best guys pitching even if it's only like one or two extra starts, like I'm like a six man rotation. That's maybe that subtracts one or two starts from everybody for the rest of the season. But I still think that those one or two could be those two starts could take place in a game that the blue Jays absolutely have to win. And they need their absolute best guys. Like going into this Red Sox series, their top four is pitching. I, and I wouldn't change that. I, those guys need to pitch. And that's kind of how I would settle the rotation. Yeah. I mean, We've seen the six-man rotation before, and that's why I just go back to what I said earlier. I just, you know, just part of me thinks that they obviously could make a clear-cut decision and move somebody to the bullpen, or they can keep all six guys around, and then they could, or like what Mark was saying, maybe if they're going to limit Alec Manoa's start, or place him one time, give him an extra turn through the rotation, give Ryu an extra day of rest, kind of like a spot start thing. I just, I feel like there's a way, too, that they're going to try and keep both uh, Mats and Stripling around to start for the rest of the year. Maybe that's also another alternative they make, which is why I wonder, like, I mean, it, they could easily use all these guys in different situations or, you know, in different, like, it doesn't have to be the same thing every time. That's why I think they could be flexible with it, but they can also be pretty set in stone with it and make a, a final move and don't go back to it. But, you know, the, the schedule is in the Jays' favor. They got 56 games left, two and a half back of a wild card spot. Like I said, you got 10 games against Baltimore. You got seven games against the Twins four games against the angels next week, two games against the nationals in a couple weeks as well. They're on the road and you got 29 games at Rogers center from here on out. So, you know, it's in their favor. They could, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they, they handled this rotation. Cause I'm very intrigued as well. Cause I feel like after this double header, there's going to have to be some sort of answer if not, or maybe they just stick with a six man. Like you, like we were mentioning, like, again, we've seen it before, or they kind of, you know, are flexible with the way they handle things, but it's a good situation to have. And that's why I go back to what Mark was saying about how Ross Stripling is actually better out of the bullpen. When I went go back in April saying, you know, Ross Stripling should eventually be in the bullpen because obviously the bullpen was struggling and he wasn't good as a starter at the time. And he would be a good booster for the bullpen if the Jays went out and got an arm and they can maybe move Stripling there. But my, just my thoughts have changed. And I think, you got again, you got to stick with the guys that who or have pitched better. And Ross Stripling's been that guy this year who's pitched better. So as much as he's had an inflated ERA going back to April, we do know, you know, other than the numbers, we have seen that he has been pitching better uh, than Steven Matz. And I think he's been a little bit more consistent as well. So besides that one start a couple of weeks ago, I think he's been especially at two games now or two uh, starts at Rogers Center as well. It's been 
it's been Ross Stripling who's had the upper hand. So we'll see what happens though. And it's a good situation to have, but now the Jays have to run the table, no matter who's out on the mound this weekend, at least you have your best four starters going. Um, like I was, I was mentioning, you got Manoa, you got Barrios, you got Ray, you got Ryu all at some point in this series. So, and the Red Sox have also cooled down a bit. So that's why it's a good opportunity to have. Unlike last time where the Jays were all, you know, everyone was anxious to play the Red Sox and the Red Sox kind of, you know, dominated a little bit in Buffalo. I feel like, you know, the Jays are back at home now. The Red Sox have cooled off. This is a better situation for the Jays this time around. And you hope that they can somewhat take advantage of it this weekend. Yeah, I was at first really scared going into the series. I'm still really scared of the Red Sox. Um, and, you know, they can, like they did last time, the Blue Jays swept the Rangers and then the Red Sox popped their bubble. Um, the Red Sox can do the same thing here. They can come out, they can win three of four, um, even a split. I think, you know, I think both teams would be happy with a split in this series, but um, some Jays fans would be a little bit disappointed with that. Um, the Red Sox can really pop the Blue Jays bubble here, but I was talking with uh, some of my Red Sox friends last night and I was saying how scared I was for this series and how it's really make or break it for the Blue Jays. It feels like the biggest series since, you know, 2016 for the Blue Jays. It's um, such a huge deal heading into this series. Um, and they were saying that the Blue Jays can make or break the Red Sox season this series because the Red Sox, like you mentioned, Bryson, they've been really struggling. I think they've lost six of eight or they lost, they got swept by one team. Then they lost two of three to the Tigers. I think it was, um, they've been really struggling. Their rotation is pretty horrible. I mean, you look at the guys in, um, their rotation and the ERA they've had in the second half since the start of July, even going back to the start of June, um, uh, it's been horrible for them. So, you know, you hope the Blue Jays can take advantage of that. You hope they can come out when two of three, or excuse me, two of four or three of four, maybe, or, you know, who knows, maybe even a sweep, but uh, I, I'm not going to get my hopes up for that. But um, that really changed my perspective because I really um, didn't realize how bad the Red Sox were doing. And again, you know, last time the Jays faced the Red Sox, the Red Sox were struggling as well. And they came out and, you know, took both games, I think of that two game set, because one of them was rained out. Um, if I remember correctly, but you know, who knows, we will see what happens. Um, another pitching conundrum for the blue Jays is the bullpen. Uh, the bullpen has been really good lately. Um, you know, we can trash it all we want for the beginning of the season, but they've improved a lot with the arms they've got. Um, even though you do have two games in the series with the bullpen, putting up some scary numbers, you know, you got that bread hand blown save, um, in, or not technically a save but blown opportunity in the 10th inning of game one, you got that, you know, the six runs, the bullpen gives up in either the second game or third game of this series. Um, despite that, the bullpen has been pretty good. Uh, but a lot of people have concerns about Jordan Romano and rightfully so he hasn't been himself lately over his last, um, few appearances, his last nine games, 8.2 innings pitched. He has an 8.31 ERA over his last nine games. That's eight earned runs over 8.2 innings pitched. He's walked four guys, struck out 10. Uh, batters have an OBP of 395 against him over that span, an OPS of 1.159 over that span. Uh, it's been really tough going for Jordan Romano lately. And, you know, these struggles kind of date back to – the beginning of June, but even then he had a whole bunch of scoreless stretches. You know, he gave up a few hits a couple times, but a whole bunch of scoreless stretches. It's really been since the start of July. He's given up a run in one, two, three, four, five of his eight outings, or excuse me, nine outings um, since the start of July. So it's been really concerning with him. Um, and a lot of people, um, you know, myself included, I think in this are advocating for Adam Simber to take the closing spot. Uh, just looking over that span. Well, Jordan Romano has an ERA over eight um, over that span. Adam Simber, his ERA is 0 0.63 since the start of July. He's made 14.1 innings pitched. He's appeared in 14 games. He's only given up a run on one occasion, and that was against, of all teams, the Red Sox um, in a 7-4 to four loss um, on July 21st. But that's the only run he's given up. Uh, since he's become a Blue Jay. He struck out 11 guys, walked only one, given up six hits. Uh, batters are batting 125 against him. They have an OPS of 328 against him over that span. He's been nothing but phenomenal 
for the Blue Jays. So I think it's time to start talking about whether Jordan Romano needs to be taken off that closing role. Um, now, this isn't a long-term thing. Uh, certainly not. I think Jordan Romano is a better long-term pitcher for the Blue Jays. He has the stuff to be a closer. He has a velocity. He has that wipeout slider. He has the great stuff and movement to be a closer. But just right now, when the Blue Jays are in the thick of it, they need to win every game. You can't afford to have Jordan Romano go out there in a one-run game when he's sporting an ERA over eight in his last nine games. Um, you just can't afford that if you're the Blue Jays. So I really think there has to be a conversation about shaking up the leverage situations, putting Adam Simber in more opportunities where the Blue Jays are tied up, up by one run in the ninth inning. He's got to be pitching in those big, big situations. If if I'm Charlie Montoyo, that's where I got to be using him. I do agree, honestly. Like I, I do like Jordan Romano. He's been lights out at times this season, but his last going back to July, his last eight outings, as you said, or nine outings have been very inconsistent. I mean, there's been a few scoreless ones, but then you look at, you know, two earned runs and earned run over some of those outings. And that's really going to bloat your ERA. And you can't have that. I mean, even you go back to the one of the games against Cleveland where it was eight to four. I mean, Taylor Saucedo didn't even allow or didn't record an out. He had four earned runs charged to him in the eighth inning. And then Jordan Romano comes in, Oddly enough, he struck out the side, which is, I, I guess, a good thing. But when you allow two home runs, and I think he allowed a double as well. So he had quite a few hits charged to him, and th that's not good enough, honestly. Like, if he was one hit away from the Blue Jays potentially losing that game or, or going behind the, the against Cleveland and then having to come back with against them or potentially lose that game, and that would have drastically influence the way the series goes like a, a three to one series win versus a split series is very different especially when you need that third win you you can't afford to lose all these games especially especially considering how the early parts of the season went and there's so many blown games and you're at the point where if those keep happening or even if one or two of those happen every couple of weeks your season is probably not going to end the way you want it to However, with Adam Simber, I think that does change things. And I mean, even with Brad Hand, I don't think that many people would put him as the solidified closer. I think he's more of a eighth inning or still late inning guy, eighth inning probably, but inning guy, but not a not a closer. Adam Simber, I think, deserves it. He, he pitched in all, three of the four games against Cleveland, three innings, zero earned runs, two strikeouts. Honestly, I, I think he does deserve it. He, he does. And since coming to the Blue Jays, you mentioned, Mark, he's just been fantastic. And he, I mean, this doesn't really necessarily help his case, but he looks like he's extremely into it. And you watch those reactions after the game and it's clear that he wants the big, uh, he wants those big innings for the Blue Jays. I think you give it to him. I think you, the way I can't remember who I was talking about. I said this about somebody earlier on in the season, but you give him the closer role until he proves to you that he can't close. And you got a big series against the Red Sox. You got, I mean, even you look at that next home stand, you got Oakland, you got Chicago, the, the White Sox, you know, they got, there's some good teams coming up that you desperately are going to need your best guys pitching against. And I mean, with Liam Hendricks on that, that White Sox team, or no, is he, is he with Chicago? Uh, yeah, he's with Chicago. I couldn't remember. I knew he was with Oakland for so many years, but regardless, he like when you're against so many good teams, you got to have your best guys. And, you know, we talk about, you need your best five in your rotation. You need your best four against the Red Sox as a starter you need your best relievers as well and that's the, the honestly i think that adam simber does deserve it until he proves that he can't and i mean he's been getting guys out he hasn't really allowed many hits he's done his job honestly and he hasn't even been with uh, with the marlins he hasn't even really been a guy that pitches that late in the games he's usually earlier on in the game at times he can pitch later but he's pretty much switched roles since coming to the blue jays and he's handled it well so Jordan Romano, I mean, I still would give him a chance, but I think you, if you have a three run lead or a four run lead, then you give him the chance in the ninth inning. Maybe you give him a different, you know, seventh or eighth inning chance, depending on the score. But if it's the ninth inning, three runs or less, which is a safe situation, it has to be Adam Simber, I think, going into very meaningful games. I mean, it's the early August. You got two months left. You got to win probably 45 of those games honestly and Adam Simber I think gives you the best chance to close out almost all of those games that you go into them with a with a short lead 
Yeah, see, I don't think there's much of a, you know, debate or anything. Just because ever since Kirby Yates went down, there's been an unofficial closer. And you got to ride the hot hand. And you guys were mentioning all the numbers. I don't, you know, it's ever since coming here, like Mark, Mark you mentioned one run across 14 and a third innings ever since coming to the Blue Jays. Uh, he gets a second career save last night. You got to go with Adam Simber for the time being. I mean, I just, we, we see, we've seen it too many times this year. Jacob, you mentioned it right off the top in terms of winnable games that the Jays have lost. We saw it this past Monday um, against Cleveland in game one, the game that they arguably could have won and they kind of blow it late in the game, something that we've seen a lot this year again. But, you know, for Jordan Romano as well, you guys mentioned his numbers over the past week. He's still, there's still an unofficial closer on this team. So if the Jays want to go with Adam Simber, I don't think there's much of an argument because of how much better he has been. Um, and ever since coming here too, in late, in late June for Adam Simber, he has an op held opponents to a 125 batting average. The guy's been dominant left, right, and center. And for who knows how long this is for, and this is another uh, situation where the Jays don't have to make a firm, you know, commitment for the rest of the year. You ride the hot hand, you ride the best reliever in your bullpen. And right now it's Adam Simber, um, unfortunately. And Jordan Romano, I think, you know, he's obviously a lot better than what he's been pitching like. Who knows how long it lasts for? Because, I mean, maybe later on in the season he can close again. But that's the beauty of having an unofficial closer is that you can throw in so many different guys in so many different situ uh, situations, different innings, a different leverage, high leverage, low leverage. You guys know the how it works. So, you know, and based off of this, you only have really three options that, you know, you, you go to right now. And I think it's either Romano, Hand, or Simber. And I think Simber is number one, Romano is number two, Hand's number three in terms of how comfortable you guys feel with that right now. So regardless if they put Romano in maybe seventh or eighth inning, I feel like it's, that'd be one of those two. Anyway, you use hand and maybe another one of that. And then of course you have other good solid relievers on this team who can fit this in. And this is what Charlie Montoyo was saying at the beginning of the year in terms of a bad bullpen is this, these are our guys. And now over the course of the season, this bullpen has gotten significantly better. And Charlie Montoyo has so many other options because at the beginning of the year, let's say Jordan Romano was pitching like this back in May there would have been no options. The Jays would have had nothing that you would have had to throw Romano, no matter what you would have had to throw like any of those guys. Uh, we like Tyler Chatwood was closing games for this team back in May. And I think that says a lot and how far we've come uh, from that uh, time in the season. And now Charlie Montoya has the opportunity to make the change, make us, and it doesn't have to be, it could be like a change for a week. Like I said, it could be a short-term thing. It can be strictly riding the hot hand. And if you want to go from that, you know, I guess strategy, and I don't know how you don't, I don't know how you don't, how is Adam Simber not that guy that's closing right now? And that's why he probably came out last night. He got the save. And I mean, I don't be surprised if you continue to see this because Charlie Montoya, I feel based on what we've seen this year, he rides the hot hand and he gives everybody a fair opportunity, but closing in on August 6th. Now you kind of, you got, you got to go with your hot hand and you can't just be giving every single guy in the bullpen a chance, right? It's not April anymore. So Adam Simber, the ninth inning guy, Jordan Romano, seventh or eighth inning, this can last for this weekend. And then maybe Romano's closing again next week. And that's the beauty of it. So right now, yeah, it is Adam Simber and he has been the best guy in this bullpen and going back to the trade back in late June, what a trade that the Jays did make for Adam Simber because he's turned out to be pretty much their best uh, bullpen piece right now as well, like I just mentioned. And he is, have you know, very reliable and he looks like he's having a good time. Um, he's, you know, the past two times, I guess he's closed things out or even unofficially closed it out for a save or just closing it out without a save. He's been very excited in the ninth inning. He's getting, and you're kind of getting like Jason Grilly vibes of how like he gets excited and he gets pumped up to end the game. So it's really cool to see, especially in front of a home crowd. And yeah, I don't think there's much of an argument right now that you got to ride the hand with uh, Adam Simber. Yeah, um, completely off topic, completely unrelated. Uh, congratulations to the Canadian women's soccer team. They just won gold just at the Olympics yep. in a wild shootout against Sweden. So congrats to them. But yeah, you got to ride the hot hand. You got to win these games. Um, it it's as simple as that you gotta have your best chance to win same as when we talk about in the rotation stripling probably gives the team their best chance to win every five days it's the same in the bullpen if you're in a one-run game if you're in a tie game putting adam simber out there gives you your best chance to win um and it's as simple as that right now and i hope it doesn't stay like that everyone is rooting for jordan romano he's the closer of this team he's the closer of the future 
but just so happens right now he's going through some struggles and that's okay you know he's human he's a pitcher every pitcher goes through some bad times um and it just so happens that he needs some time to work it out and uh I, I think that's the reality of this team right now and the reality of this bullpen. Um, and as far as Brad Hand goes, I don't want him pitching in high leverage situations at all. Um, he's like Romano. I looked it up. He has an 8.1 ERA since the start of July. So he's not someone I want going out there in a one-run game, in a game where it's tied 2-2 in the bottom of the 10th or top of the 10th. Um, not to blame Charlie Montoya for that. He didn't have anyone else to go to in that situation. Um, but again, don't want him pitching in a situation like that in the future um, if we can help it. Uh, another takeaway from this week or, you know, this past seven-game homestand is Vladimir Guerrero Jr. He has struggled a little bit at home. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, you know, you can just see it. He hasn't been putting up the video game numbers that he normally does and that we're accustomed to for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. He only has one home run in the last seven games at home. Of course, it was a huge home run, right? It was a game-tying two-run home run in that eventual five to two loss, but still hasn't been putting up those crooked numbers that we expect of him. Uh, are you concerned about him? I know that's kind of a stupid question to ask with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Uh, I know some people have been concerned. Some people aren't a fan of where he's hitting in the lineup. Of course, he's hitting second now instead of third. Um, maybe he doesn't have the same sort of protection he's accustomed to. Um, you know, it's George Springer, number one, him, number two, Marcus Sumia, number three. Um, maybe he's just not as comfortable in that position in the lineup, maybe not a fan of hitting in Toronto. You know, that's, he's been criticized all season for only hitting in a minor league ballpark. Maybe he doesn't like hitting in Toronto at the Rogers center. Who knows? Um, what are you guys taking away from his little cold spout as it is right now, if we can even call it that. And uh, do you think that he should be moved back to the number three spot do you think that's something the Blue Jays have to consider? Or do you think this is just, you know, it's a long season. He got an off day. Maybe he's dealing with something behind the scenes. Maybe he just needs a little bit of time, of time to get back into the groove of it. Well, Mark, I was praying you weren't going to mention the hitting in a minor league ballpark because I just know that so many people are going to use that as legitimate evidence. But, I mean, unfortunately, his numbers, they have dipped a little bit over the summer. I don't think that this is necessarily a Toronto-only thing. I mean you remember he was hitting close to 340 coming into July. You know, it's been dipping slowly since then. He's constantly been around the 330s, which is still pretty good. I mean, pretty good. That's some of the best numbers in baseball. I mean, like, let's be real here, but it's been slowly dipping. It is now at 322 is average after the game against Cleveland or the, the four game series is concluded slugging again. I mean, same thing with all these numbers. They're sort of dipping, but they're saying staying pretty similar to, what they've been over the last couple games home runs, I think is what's starting to dip. He hasn't, he's hit, he hit one, as you said, in Cleveland, but that's the only, th or against Cleveland, but that's the only home run that he's hit this homestand. And other than that, he hit a home run in the last game against the Red Sox. The last time the Blue Jays saw him or saw them, but he hasn't hit it, which was on actually, let me get this. He hit a home run on July the 29th. He the last home run he hit aside from that was ju was July 21st. So it's he's actually sort of been slowing down with the home runs. I mean, you remember he and Shohei Otani were neck and neck, and he was ahead of him by a couple. It's not necessarily been like that since the start of the summer. I mean, he he had that two home run game against the Texas Rangers, and then he had the the home run against the National League in the All Star game. But aside from that, it's sort of been slowing down, and I don't think that that's necessarily. I don't know if I can call it a bad thing because I mean, at some point, I think we kind of expected him to slow down a little bit. And I mean, 34 home runs, I think is his total as of right now, 34. Correct. So uh, that is still fantastic. And I mean, even if he continues at this pace, he could still end up with 40 at the end of the season. I just think maybe he's trying to do a little too much when you put him in the second spot behind George Springer, who's constantly hitting home runs and he had a couple off the first pitch of the game, which good way to start the bottom of the first I'll put it that way it was very entertaining but maybe he's trying to do a little too much when you take away I mean like you take away Bo Bichette whose numbers have again stayed pretty similar in fact they've been going up he's constantly a, a high twos you know 290 295 ish but you take away that good hitter away from Guerrero maybe he's saying okay well now that you know Bichette's not getting on base I have to do it for him or, or something like that and 
perhaps that's the case. You know, you take away the the guys in ahead of him, in front of him, and now it's not Guerrero comes up with guys on base. It's Guerrero comes up with a clean slate and he's able to do something, which isn't a bad thing. And I mean, good hitters are going to get on base. They are going to hit, but maybe the two spot isn't necessarily the, the best spot for him. And it's just, it, it's a tough situation. I mean, he he's done so well all season. He's done so well in Buffalo in the three spot. I think that's maybe where you keep him. He, he, maybe you, I mean, even Marcus Simeon, his numbers have, all these guys that are that did super well at the start of the season, their numbers have sort of dipped and Simeon's at the 270s at now, but still pretty good. Maybe you, you go back to Springer in the leadoff spot. I don't think you change him at all, hitting over 300 since he came back or, or this homestand. You leave him in the first spot. Perhaps you move Bichette back to second, maybe Simeon to third and then Guerrero to fourth or you whatever, maybe you keep Guerrero at third, but... Regardless, I think Vladimir Guerrero Jr. should move down one spot. Just get him more comfortable in a spot that he's used to. Give him guys to potentially get on base. And I mean, with Bo Bichette, a free swinger, very likely that he gets on base. And I mean, even George Springer, he's, if he's not hitting a home run, he's hitting a single or a double, which is st- that's that's a very good option for Guerrero. Uh, that's all I think it needs to be. And I mean, we talk a lot about home runs. I mean, he hasn't even had a ton of hits this series, this homestand even as well. He had since the the game against Cleveland or the the series against Kansas City, I think it's 26 at bats, something like that, and only like eight hits, which I mean, it, not awful, but it's it's not the numbers that you expect from him and that you're accustomed to seeing from him. So maybe he's just maybe it is just a little bit of a case of he's moved to Toronto. He's now in the second spot, maybe revert back to that third spot. And that's hopefully that's all it takes. Maybe, maybe that doesn't even need to happen. Maybe he just, he comes up back against the Red Sox and just absolutely destroys them. I know they have a couple starters with high ERA starting in that series. Maybe this is the option for him to turn things around. But as for now, I think the, if you're trying to make a calculated move, moving him down to the third spot, Moving his teammate Bo Bichette ahead of him is probably the ideal move, just considering how things have kind of shifted for him. See, this is where um, it's 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 conflicting because yes, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has cooled down a bit, but I'm gonna say yeah. I'm not worried. I I think everything's okay. I think it's just a cold spell. It's okay. You know, you don't expect these guys to light it up all year, like you said, Jacob. Baseball's a streaky sport. And if this is what you're going to get out of Vladimir Guerrero Jr. as a slump, I'll take it because he's still hitting it decently well. It's just not to what we saw before the All-Star break, but I'm fully confident he gets it back. And, you know, seeing his home run a couple of days ago, he got jammed and he hit a home run. Like, it didn't look like it was a home run. I mean, right off the, the swing, it didn't look like it. But I guess right after his reaction and everything, it, he obviously knew it was gone. But and even with with his home runs when he was hitting them in Buffalo and Dunedin, I'm pretty sure all of them would have won out at Rogers Center anyway. So uh, that's why the the minor league ballpark thing is kind of gets me annoyed. And he was doing the same things on the road. He was producing on the road. He was hitting home runs at major league ballparks on the road. But you know, maybe see, maybe it is him hitting second because in him hitting second. Sorry, at 12 games. Uh, he's batting 300, 352 on base percentage, 480 slugging percentage, and 832 OPS. And then when he's batting third, um, that's when he pretty much has his OPS above 1,000. And we're seeing like Vladimir Guerrero Jr., like, you know, what we saw earlier on in the season. However, this is where it gets a little bit conflicting because of Bo Bichette. Bo Bichette through 13 games is actually hitting better in the fourth spot. Uh, through 13 games hitting cleanup, he's batting 326, an on base percentage of 385, a slugging of 609, and on or an OPS of 993. And of course, that's a lot better than what he was hitting um, in the second spot. But also, you know, maybe that kind of cancels out because early on in the season, Bo Bichette has kind of just gotten hotter as the season went on, even close to the All Star break. He, he's just been getting better as the season's gone on. So I don't know how much you want to look at that for or take a look into that for, but um it's just it's a tough one because the jays make this lineup change uh the the right the rightful thing that everyone knows is that george springer should be batting lead off and he has been batting lead off and we know the homestand he's had um a 560 average four home runs 10 rbis eight runs um a 
0.811 OPS. So an, a, an OPS of over 1,500 in six games at Rogers Center. That's the one thing that we know for sure of where he belongs in that leadoff spot. But yeah, it's, you know, Marcus Simeon has also dropped in the order. So does he hit, th- like he's been hitting third right now. It's just, it, it's tough because you, you wonder how much this really affects him if he's really batting second, going back to Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Or if it's just some sort of cold spell and you're not going to look too much into it. I'm not going to look too much into it right now. I'm on, I'm not worried whatsoever. I don't even think him batting second is kind of messing with him a bit. I just think he's on a cold spell and that's what I want myself to believe for now. So it's just, you know, if, if we go two weeks in the future here and down the stretch and this continues to happen, I may have a different answer, but right now I think he's just, you know, slumping just a bit, not too much, just a bit. Cause he's getting base hits here and there. He's still playing really good defensively at first base. Like I said, he had a home run getting jammed. You know, th- this is still Vladimir Guerrero Jr. of 2021. So, you know, I, I don't want to look too much into this. I think he's just cold, not even, just a little bit, like just cooling off a bit. But I have I believe more that he'll heat up and get hot again compared to getting even worse and cooling down even more. So that's where I stand with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and I'm not worried whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I think the moving his position in the lineup might be more of, just us, like you said, extrapolating and putting something on his struggles more than it actually is causing it. Because, you know, the lineup was changed looking back on it on July 24th. That's when the Blue Jays moved him down or moved him up to the second spot, moved Simeon to the three spot, Springer back to number one, Bichette to the four spot. Um, but you look at just, you know, Vlad's numbers in all of July were not up to what it normally is. Like he hit 371. In the month of June, he had an OPS of 1.217 in the month of June. And then in the month of July, it was down to 286 batting average OPS of 941. So like as much as we say he was slumping, still an OPS of 941 OPS plus for that month of 150. So, um, but, but he was worse than, you know, we normally expect him to be in the month of July. So I think it might just be something where, you know, the season is getting to him. Um, you know, we talk about someone like Ross Stripling having to change and make adjustments as the season goes on. As good as Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is and how much better he is than someone like Ross Stripling, um, he's still someone who's going to have to make those adjustments. And, you know, as a wear and tear of a 162-game season gets on him compared to a 60-game season like last year, you know, he's going to have to make changes. He's going to have to adapt to those stresses on his body. And I think we're seeing that right now. And yes, in the month of August, four games, he's hitting 222 OPS of 708, which is um, compared to his own splits, compared to himself, his uh, career totals, it's an OPS plus of 32 um, for the month of August. So pretty horrible. But then you look at the OPS plus compared to the rest of the league, it's 94. So it's like, you know, as much as we can complain about how bad he is and, you know, how much he's slumping and the concerns that we have for him still pretty darn good. He still leads all of baseball in RBI. He still leads the American league in on base percentage. He leads all of baseball in OPS, OPS plus total bases. Um, He's still doing ridiculous things. It's just a little bit of a cold spout. If you have to make a change in the lineup, I think I would move Marcus Simeon to number two, move Vladdy to number three. That's the only thing I'm fiddling with. Cause you look like you mentioned Bryson, George Springer, I am not touching him right now. He is, it's a summer of George and he is doing everything you could ever ask for in the leadoff spot. Bo Bouchette, I'm not touching him right now. He's really coming to his own in the number four spot. Even if it's only been two weeks there, he has seemed to really enjoy hitting behind guys like Margaret Simeon and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. So I'm not changing a damn thing about George Springer or Bo Bouchette. The only thing I may be swapping is Guerrero and Simeon. Besides that, I'm not messing with anything and like we said, I think it'll come around. It's just a couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, down the stretch, I think we'll see Vladdy get back to what he was earlier this season, or at least close to it. Who who knows whether we can expect an MVP-type season from him the entire year, but he's at least going to get closer to that than he is right now. Um, okay. We got a series against the Red Sox to look forward to. Four games over this weekend. Doesn't get any bigger than this. Uh, before we wrap it up, what predictions do you have for this weekend? I think I'm going to be a little bit modest. I'm going to say the Blue Jays split it. They take two of four. 
I think we can be happy with two of four. You know, maybe it's not what you expect from a team that's going to run the table and win the wild card, but against a team that the Blue Jays have struggled against this season, you got to be happy with two of four. Uh, what are you guys expecting this weekend from the Blue Jays? Just by looking at the pitching matchups, I think the Blue Jays easily take three or four from them, from the Red Sox. Because so tonight it's Alec Manoa versus Nathan Ivaldi. Manoa 247 ERA versus Ivaldi's 371 ERA. Comparable or not comparable. Uh, Manoa's numbers are clearly better, but I, I wouldn't say that that's a clear cut win. Double header on Saturday. You got Nick Pavetta against Robbie Ray. Robbie Ray is much better than him. Three, uh, 457 compared to 304 ERA. In the second, in the nightcap of that double header, you got. I'm hoping I pronounced this correctly, but Tanner Houck for the Red Sox, 246 ERA against Jose Barrios, making his second Blue Jays start, combined ERA of 331, and then Garrett Richards versus Hyunjin Ryu in the fourth start. So I'm saying they easily take three or four, easily with huge quotation marks, but it, I think it's very, very, very possible that the Blue Jays take that. I mean, you know, you know what that could do to the wild card standings is the Blue Jays are one game behind of the New York Yankees from the second wild card spot out of Oakland, but the Red Sox are two and a half games ahead of the Athletics, or, or ahead of both of those teams. They have a, a plus two point five lead. That could easily change the entire direction of the season, and then you're back to even or close to that, and then we could be in for a very, very interesting end to that season. But enough rambling. I think three or four definitely possible you're really tempting me to call a sweep but i'm not going to do that okay because you know this team loves to disappoint me at some points he loves they love to disappoint everyone but they also love to get people excited i was thinking three out of four as well i like the way this uh series is lined up i told you earlier you have the, your four best guys in the rotation all pitching at some point this weekend and ever since the all-star break i think mark you mentioned it uh, the lowest starting rotation, the lowest ERA in the American League at 266. The only thing here is, you know, in a close game, you know, the Red Sox, it's not always, it's not going to be a blow up. Most likely um, every game is going to be within range. The Jays have to fix their ways of hitting in past the seventh inning. I mean, we know about the run differential. We know how good they are, um, but run differentials here how about this one through innings one to six plus 133 second in the MLB. Seventh inning or later, minus 22. That's tied for 25th in the league. Record when scoring four, four or fewer runs, 12 and 38. Record when scoring five plus runs, 44 and 11. Thank you, Josh Goldberg, for all those numbers. This team needs to start hitting in the, in the later innings. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's pretty much the message here, um, you know, especially against the Red Sox. This is crucial. This is one of the most important series of the year. You get it at home, and I don't want to jump too ahead of myself here, but... Well, first of all, the Jays easily could be a game and a half out of the wild card spot right now. But unfortunately, Oakland uh, came back a couple of days ago against the Padres in the ninth inning. Uh, that kind of stung a little bit because I was actually watching that live. But here's the thing, too. Six and a half games back of the division. If you take three out of four, you do the math. You're, you're getting in range here. I'm not, call, I'm not, I'm not saying they're going to win the division, but they, are, they could have an opportunity here to get closer to one of these teams and of course the rays they're out there right now they're hot as well but you can get closer to the red sox by taking three out of four this is important start hitting the ball later on in the innings brad hand don't come into the game and blow it in the 10th inning as a first impression you guys got this three out of four it could be a huge huge um upgrade for the jays come monday i think what you would love to see tonight in game one is for the Blue Jays to have the same type of game they had the last time they played the Red Sox, a 13 to one win. Yep. Cause that way you get, you know, all your relievers rested, the, all the guys you want to put in, in the high leverage situations, you get them ready for game two, three, and four, cause you know, you're going to need them, but you get them rested, you get the offense going, you get a little confidence heading into those three games. That's what I want to see. And, and, you know, we're lucky that we have a double header in this series because the Blue Jays record in seven run, seven inning games, we know is a lot better than a nine inning game. So anyways, uh, we are very excited. It's much watch TV for the Blue Jays. And um, as much as they still have a couple months left in the season after this, everything comes down to this. It seems like it's a huge series. that's really going to test this team. We will see how it turns out. We will talk to you 
at the end of this four game series on Sunday or Monday as it is an off day. Um, until then, you can rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts. You can support our podcast by going to patreon.com slash section 138 pod. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at section 138 pod. And you can watch all of our episodes on YouTube um, and find all our stuff there. Um, so we're very excited for this weekend. We'll see what happens. We will talk to you after this series. Ah! <sighs>